five minutes that night, I felt like, okay, this is someone who's clearly understanding this stuff the way that I am. The show was In the Heights. It was Lynn's first show in New York, and I could tell right away, this is someone who is, uh, he's gifted at writing hip hop, but he's also great at writing ballads, and he knows how to tell a story that's worth telling. Lynn, you know, Lynn's family is Puerto Rican, and he's talked about how when he grew up, he didn't see roles for someone like him to play. He kept seeing roles written for Latino men that were uh, criminals, that were gangsters. There was no reflection of the life that he saw on stage or in movies. Well, he wanted to fix that, which is why In the Heights has parents and children and business owners and citizens. The other thing I was very excited about that night is that In the Heights is not corny. When you work in the theater, you get to see a lot of things that are very, very corny, and that wasn't, and I will always be grateful to him for that. So I wrote a review when I tried to express why I thought Lynn was this rising talent, what I thought he understood. And um, I found out later that when he read the review, he had the same feeling that I had when I saw his show, which is this is someone who's sort of on my wavelength thinking about these things the same way I do. The publicist for the show fixed us up, and one night after In the Heights, in the summer of 2008, we met for a drink. One drink became several drinks, and then several more drinks. And in the course of that conversation, I only realized later, because both of our memories of that night are a little hazy, he told me about what he wanted to do next. He wanted to write a hip hop mixtape about the life of Alexander Hamilton. And I thought that was a crazy idea. At least I think I thought it was a crazy idea because I don't actually remember my reaction to it in the moment, but I still think it's a cra it is a crazy idea. I mean, the idea that founding fathers are going to wrap their cabinet debates to each other's faces is ludicrous, but it's also great. And I think one of the lessons to take away from this is that sometimes the ludicrous ideas that everyone thinks are nuts, those are the ideas that ultimately change the world. Well, I certainly wasn't going to bet against the guy, uh, and that was confirmed a couple months later. Has everybody seen the YouTube clip from 2009 when he performed the opening number at the White House? Yeah. Everyone knows this? If anyone hasn't yet, if you're not among the, you know, whatever it's up to now, X million views. The White House, President Obama's administration, in its early days, asked uh, uh, some artists to come perform in the East Room. Lynn was one of them. They wanted him to do a song from In the Heights. His musical had just won four Tony Awards. He was still running on Broadway, huge hit. This is an easy call, right? Lynn counters by saying he wants to perform a song that nobody's heard before, he's never performed it before, a hip hop track about Alexander Hamilton. To the credit of the Obama administration, they said, okay and they let him close the program with this. Now that YouTube clip is an amazing document because now Hamilton has taken over the world and we're losing the idea, losing the sense of, of how crazy it is. But that YouTube clip lets us see people reacting to the premise, not to the performance, at least not right away. You get to see what it was like for people in our time to have their first reaction to this crazy idea, not hearing that it's won a bunch of awards, that it's double platinum, that it's just broken records for how much business it's doing on Broadway, that everybody loves it. And what is the reaction? They laugh. Like, everyone thinks it's hilarious. You can see them as they, he says what he's going to do, and he tells them, don't laugh, because he's not kidding. And as they listen to it, what happens? They get quiet, and they stop laughing, and they start taking it really seriously. And then they get into it, and then at the end, it's a huge standing ovation. And in a way, that four minutes sort of telescopes everything that happened in the six years after that. I mean, it's the same pattern that I got to see happen, except it's not four minutes in one room, it's six years in a country of 300 million people, um, where suddenly my nieces think I'm super cool because I'm involved with Hamilton. Uh, now, there, so you can see the one, the, one of the audacious things about Hamilton is very clear, which is that he's going to be using hip-hop to tell this story. The thing that might not be as obvious, I didn't even realize it at the time, is that the subject is just as audacious. Like, when he told me that night in 2008 that he's going to do a hip-hop mixtape about Alexander Hamilton, the hip-hop was novel, but it was just as novel to hear him want to do something about the founding of the country. So here's a quiz, or a survey, maybe. I didn't, even, I didn't think about this in time to put it in the book, but it's interesting to talk about it when I give these talks. When Lynn started telling the story about the founding of the country, what other stories of the founding of the country existed? I don't need your textbooks. 
there's a musical, 1776, that was written 40 years ago. There was the John Adams miniseries on HBO maybe like 10 years ago. There's the faces on our money. But like, what other pictures of our founding do we have? We have the portraits that hang on the walls. And we have, but like, to shout it out if you've seen it. Like, have you seen a dramatization of the founding of the United States? That's crazy, right? I mean, look at the story, how dramatic it is, the huge personalities, the heroism, the high stakes, and somehow Americans have this blind spot about telling the story of the founding of our own country. This is, I think, something that's gonna be important as we, as we get into this story more. So, um, and again, like I said, I wish I had thought of it in time to put it in the book, I just didn't. Uh, Lynn wasn't thinking that when he got the idea. When we had that first conversation, he was reading Ron Chernow's book. He wasn't reading it as a historian, he was reading it because he wanted something to take on vacation, to read by the pool in Mexico. Um, but once it, got, once it got into his brain that Hamilton led a hip-hop life and that he needed to get that story out, he, he told me that this sensation was feeling like super prego, like super pregnant, like this idea is coming out. <laughs> so over the next couple of years after that White House performance, he writes more, he starts working with Tommy Kale. You know, a big part of the story that I think is easy to miss, there's a paradox, right? What Lynn has done is like one of the great single-handed achievements of anybody in the history of Broadway. He had the idea, he wrote the music, he wrote the lyrics, he wrote the book, uh, meaning the libretto of the script, uh, and he played the lead role, right? Like, you can count on one hand the people who have done that in the entire history of Broadway. But the only reason this works is because of his collaborators that he has this incredible relationship with. You sort of need both those things working simultaneously, the single-handed achievement and the teamwork, for the thing to work the way it does. So after the White House night, he starts working with Tommy Kale, his friend, the incredibly gifted director, um, and they start figuring some stuff out. Now, in a way, a mixtape would have been a much easier way to arrive at the point where a lot of you are now. You haven't seen it, you've heard it you've, on your headphones. Um, it, they could have skipped a lot of steps, but when they decided to put it on stage, you have to go through those steps. And, you know, like, what do you, have the actors wear if they're rapping but they're playing the founding fathers? Do you have them wear stuff from the 18th century? Do you have them wear like their street clothes? Is it the era of the sound or the era of the historical reality? On you know, if you put it on film, like you get you need the muskets, you need the horses and all that like colonial Williamsburg stuff. This is a lesson. One of the great lessons of this whole crazy experience. One of the reasons why I wanted to write the book is because like it's, it all comes together so well that it looks obvious, like it looks foreordained that it was gonna be this way. I'm telling you, nothing was obvious, nothing was foreordained. All of these decisions had to be made, things had to be tried, sometimes thrown out, to arrive at what now looks completely effortless. So all those decisions getting made, the thing growing into what it became, that's what I got to see up close. I had left the, the magazine business, I'd gone to work at the public theater, in New York, and part of my job in the artistic staff was to propose artists to my boss, the artistic director, my good friend, Oscar Eustace. Uh, the first artist that I proposed to him was Lynn. At this point, no one had seen anything of Hamilton except that night at the White House. And so I said to Oscar, let's bring him in and find out what's going on. Um, Oscar, I love Oscar. He tells a story to get a laugh, so I'll tell it. When I proposed this idea to Oscar, Oscar was like, nah. Like, he didn't wanna take that meeting. Um, because when uh, In the Heights won its four Tony Awards, it won them at the expense of a show of Oscars. And so I told him, let's, let's, you know, let's have him come in, let's talk to him. He said, okay, I emailed Lynn and told Lynn that my boss was incredibly psyched to meet him. Uh, and so we set it up, and in the summer of 2011, uh, Lynn came in, and the three of us talked, and it would take another couple years. It, again, nothing was foreordained, but the public ended up being the place that got to do the world premiere of Hamilton. Now, that summer of 2011 is important to me because on one of those first meetings, Lynn handed me a CD, which I don't even, like, does anyone even have CDs anymore? But, you know, piece of plastic that I guess is like one of those objects that ends up changing my life because it had like nine or 10 of the Hamilton demos on it. This is just Lynn singing his own songs, even the female parts. And I had this very vivid memory in the summer of 2011, sitting in my apartment in Brooklyn, and 
listening to that CD on my laptop. And uh, his demo of Helpless, you all know Helpless, right? It's the love duet, it's sung mainly by Eliza. Her voice is pitched pretty high, right? Well, Lynn singing that song in falsetto and then dropping down to his own voice for the 16 bars in the middle. I remember uh, when I heard that, as soon as that ended, I thought, if he finishes this thing, this is gonna be the best musical of my generation. There were still years to go, and there were a lot of moments, and I won't go into them, but there's just one that I want to leave, I want to talk about as we're getting to opening night. Um, this is in the book, and I didn't do it justice in the book. I don't think I can, really. Um, it's literally one of those times when you had to be there. So as they're developing the show, they decide that the actors are not going to be people who look like their historical counterparts. It's not going to be a bunch of white guys. It's going to be the people that they think are best equipped to play these roles. It's going to be people of color, for the most part. Chris Jackson, who plays George Washington, is black. The rest of the ensemble and the lead roles are played by actors of different races. Now, they didn't set out to make this, to make a big political statement about this. Tommy Kale, the director, was very clear about it. He, the, the, the mantra that he had is, this is a story about America then, being told by America now. And that is what America now looks like. So I had heard this, I had seen the workshops, I would kind of gotten to appreciate like, the, the approach they were taking. In May of 2014, they did a workshop at the 52nd Street uh, Project in New York. For the first time, they were staging parts of the show. So it's not just the music stands anymore, they're gonna see how it looks when people are moving, they're gonna be wearing costumes. And in the first act that day, they performed Yorktown, which if you've seen it or you've heard it, you know, is when the Americans win the war. Right? Our founders defeat the British and they secure their independence. So that morning, imagine seeing these actors, these young men and women, uh, you know, mainly um, uh, men and women of color, wearing these costumes that you've seen your whole life in the paintings and textbooks of George Washington's revolutionary troops. And when they climb on those boxes at the end of the song, and shout, we won, and the chorus swells. You just sort of felt this charge go through the room of people having seen something they've never seen before. And in seeing it, you're getting a whole new sense of the country and who it belongs to. I've never felt anything. I've seen hundreds, thousands, couple thousand shows, concerts, you name it, in my life. I've never felt anything like that first morning when we got to see that. Uh, I was not alone in feeling inspired by it because a lot of my colleagues from the public theater were there that day too. And we all left super inspired, you know, like theater matters and this is important. And went back to the office and like, no one got any work done because we just wanted to sing those songs. Like, it was just like a three day sing along after that. So after that workshop, there's a lot of buzz now around Hamilton. So much buzz that when the show went on sale at the public theater, uh, it crashed the phones, which was awkward. Um, <laughs> If you are in the theater, you know, though, what comes next. Like, there's no shortcutting what is going to happen. Uh, there are rehearsals, there are design meetings, there are scripting meetings. Lynn had to keep writing. People would see him around the building. He was writing at the public theater sometimes. So you see him shuffling around in his slippers as he's working on his ideas. Um, it takes a lot of hard work from a lot of very talented people working together to create something like this. And in a way, Seeing that helped me understand the subject. It helped me understand the American founding. Like, how did they do what they did in the 1770s and 1780s? They won a war. They sent the most powerful army in the world packing back across the Atlantic. And then they founded a country, founded a government, like no government that had ever existed in the world, bigger than any democracy that had ever been attempted. No one thought that was going to work. So not only did they work the one miracle, they worked the two miracles. And they did it in like 10 years. And it was mainly the same people. And But from watching Hamilton, watching those guys all have to find a way to work together in, this, in the pursuit of one common goal, I feel like I understand better now what it must have been like to be watching those guys in Philadelphia and in New York in the 1770s and 80s. So at the end of all this work, then you've got a show. And in New York, you do your previews, you put the show up, you have rehearsals and during the daytime, you tweak it, you fix it, you get as far down the road toward it being complete as you can, and then one night you open the doors and the critics come. 
And that was the first time where it was really like the road test, like, all right, like we think this is pretty cool, uh, our friends think it's cool, but the people who get paid to decide if things are any good, like what are they gonna say? Um, it would have been pretty weird if they'd been like, no, nah, this, this is crap, like this is no good. Um, so we were very lucky that they liked it. And because they liked it, we knew after opening night at the public that the show was gonna go to Broadway. That's where the run, that's where the next big step was gonna be moving from the public theater downtown to a big theater on Broadway uptown. And that night, at the opening night party at the public theater, that's when Lynn said to me, um, there's gonna be a book, and you should write it. And again, because nothing is obvious and nothing is foreordained, my first reaction was, I don't, I don't wanna write that book. Like, that's not, I don't, I'm not really up for it. Um, partly it's because, understand like, imagine trying to write a book that would be fit to stand alongside Hamilton. Like, it's not obvious that there's a good way to do that because Hamilton is so incredible. Another thing is, that, you know, there's, there is this kind of field of um, books about Broadway musicals. Maybe you've seen them, you know, they're like an oral history and then you put the script at the back and there are a lot of photos. And I'd been asked to do them before and I wasn't really that interested. And then the last thing is there's just a lot of life reasons not to do it. Like the first one, which is I live in Chicago by this point. I moved down here with my family. And I was going back to New York for Hamilton stuff and for public theater stuff, but writing a book is like, that's a whole new level of crazy. Uh, but so I told Lynn I'd go away and think about it. I went away and I thought about it. If you're interested in writing, or if you're interested in doing anything sort of creative in life, there's a book that you should read. Because I had read it, and it's one of the big reasons why I decided to do this book. The book is Stephen Sondheim's Finishing the Hat. And it's uh, Sondheim's book about the shows that he wrote in the first half of his career. Uh, that includes West Side Story, um, it includes Gypsy, I mean, some of the like great works that any American has ever written. Um, Sondheim had his first rule of writing, which is actually a rule of living if you think about it, is that content dictates form. What that means is you have to decide what story you're trying to tell, and once you decide that, then you figure out how you're going to tell it. You can't prejudge how you're going to achieve something until you know what it is you're trying to achieve. So I sat there in Chicago after I'd had that conversation with Lynn, thinking about Hamilton and thinking, well, what is the story, actually? Like, what is the story that you would tell in a book like this? And what I got to thinking was, Hamilton tells the story of a revolution, the American Revolution of the 18th century. The, the sending the British packing and then founding the American government and all that great stuff. But Hamilton itself is a revolution. It's changing the way that Broadway sounds, it's changing the way that we think about the founding of our country. And the thing that I got to see because I've been around it for those years is changing the lives of those young artists. You know, these guys, some of them had pretty fancy careers, but for the most part, they didn't have agents. They weren't uh, the type of actors who get offered like the really great roles. And now suddenly, not only are they getting successful, but they're skipping steps. They're becoming stars. That's a revolution too. So I thought, okay, well that's a story worth telling. This is actually two revolutions, and then what's the form? Like, what, how do you do it? And I had this picture in my head. And this picture, this image, is why, is why that book exists. It's like a rainbow, but with only two arcs. And one is the show itself, from the first number, uh, Alexander Hamilton, to the finale. So the book ought to like not have the script tucked at the back. The script ought to be the book. The second arc is, the creation of the show, which somehow needs to run alongside the show itself so that we can see the thing coming together even as the story is unfolding in this book. In other words, it's going to be like a, a huge puzzle, but I love puzzles, and Sondheim loves puzzles, so I figured let's do this. Um, the two books, if you're interested, that gave me confidence that this was going to work, Sondheim's book did it because that's how his book is set up, uh, but also uh, Jay-Z's book, Decoded. I mean, structurally, Jay-Z's book and this book are pretty similar. It's got these essays and these stories from his life, and then he goes into his songs, and then he annotates them. And that's what we decided we were going to do. So that summer of 2015, the company is getting ready for Broadway. They've moved up to this big rehearsal studio in Midtown. They're, they're loading in the stuff, the set at the theater. Um, and at that point, then I uh, start bringing my notebook when I'm around him. 
And there's a point in the book where it stops being stuff that I had to go back and reconstruct from notes I'd taken or stuff I remember to stuff that I was able to watch happen as it was happening. Um, those rehearsals when they were getting ready for Broadway, I got to hang around because I'd gotten to know everybody at that point. The, the tech on Broadway when they're getting the theater ready, there's an anecdote in the book. Um, the room where it happens is a lot of people's favorite song in the show. Uh, it's definitely up there for me. Well, uh, there's a, an, an anecdote in the book about the first time Lynn got to hear that song on Broadway with the big speakers on Broadway. Now imagine you've heard the song in your head for years. You've heard it in a downtown theater, but now you're hearing it with like the big boy speakers. And the reason why I got that anecdote in the book is because I happened to be sitting right next to the guy when he walked in and, they, and the sound designer at Evan Steinberg like flipped on the subwoofers and he got to hear the band playing this. And so that look on his face, I was watching because his head was right here. There's something about this, like if you wanna tell a story about, about something, like you just need to be around. You need to like watch the stuff happen and just have like 12 eyes around you pointing in every direction. There's one other moment, you know, I talk about the revolution in people's lives. These artists have really come to know and love. I remember the day of the first preview on Broadway, the first Broadway performance in Hamilton. It was really hot in New York, but there were still like hundreds of people on the street outside the theater all day. Like they just wanted to like take selfies under the marquee, I think. And I remember I was standing there with David Diggs, who as you know, plays Lafayette and plays Thomas Jefferson. And I just remember like watching him walk through the crowd and thinking like, this is the last time that guy's gonna be able to do that. He's not gonna be able to walk through crowds and not have anybody notice him for too much longer. And that has turned out to be true. Um, all the while, meanwhile, Lynn is still writing the show. I mean, the reason why I thought the book was gonna work to structure it this way is that I had a feeling that Lynn is a guy who sort of does his homework on the bus on the way to school. He's probably gonna be writing the final scenes of this right up until the end. So I was sort of happy. I mean, it was tough for everybody, but it was good for the book. So we had to tell the story. And there's a, there's a, a way that you can think of a story as like a timeline, you know? This event happened, that event happened, that event happened. Tommy Kale was very sharp about what a story is. The story with like a capital T and a capital S doesn't mean like this happened and this happened and this happened. It's about like the emotional experience people have where they're going through really dramatic events. So it wasn't about this happened and this happened. How did it feel when it was happening? I mean, that's what makes Hamilton so powerful is that you can feel the emotions of these people. So when we wrote the book, I thought we should tell it, we should have two perspectives. The way I thought about it, I could write the chapters, the essays, the profiles, the things that are between the songs, imagining like standing at the back of the theater and like winding the story all the way back to when these ideas left Lynn's brain. And then Lynn's footnotes would be the part that would go inside his brain to talk about where these ideas came from, his inspirations, his passions, uh, his experiences that let him write Satisfied or uh, Burn or any of these songs. Um, so then in terms of how that's gonna fit together, there is this other Tommy Kale principle about not having a filter. You know, there's a way that if you've seen Hamilton, you know this, like there's no like warm up. There's nothing to alert you to the fact that you're about to see uh, people uh, dressed in revolutionary era clothes uh, rapping cabinet debates. It just sort of asks you like to come meet it where it lives. Like Aaron Burr literally just walks on stage, downstage right, or into his shadow and starts singing. Like that's it. No filter. Very immediate. That's what we wanted to do in the book. So I told my part of the story and then told his part of the story and that's the story. No sidebars. No scholarly voices, nothing like that. Everything that's in the book that isn't one of us is a primary source, um, which maybe you've already encountered in history classes, but like, it's a document. It's an email that Lynn sent, or it's uh, something that George Washington wrote 250 years ago. But we wanted it to feel like you were right up against this story, which is exactly the way that Hamilton makes you feel. Uh, working with Lynn was excellent. If you have the chance to work with Lynn while we're in it, you definitely should. <laughs> Um, it was tricky to do it because uh, we didn't have a lot of time. Imagine now, like you're writing a book with someone who is performing on Broadway seven times a week, uh, and you live in Chicago, and you both have toddlers. So it was tricky to pull this thing off. Um, 
but it sort of is a reprise of the themes of what I said earlier about the process of the show. Like, when you're trying to get the same thing done, and it's clear what you're trying to get done, that helps. When you trust each other, and you're on the same wavelength, that helps. Um, as Tommy says about the process of working with his designers, like the shorthand was really short. We needed the shorthand to be really short to get this thing done. Uh, we had a little less than six months to write this 224 page book. Uh, except by the time we were done, it was 288 pages. Uh, because, you know, we had a lot to say. Hey, it's Hamilton. There's, we're not going to cut that corner. Uh, we sent the book to the printer two days before Christmas in 2015, and I remember that because I celebrated being done with it by going to see Star Wars that night, uh, The Force Awakens, which as you know, like the Cantina song was written by Lynn, so it's like, here we are again. Like, um, and, uh, and you know, I'm glad that we got to chart that journey for the show. Um, we sent the thing off, and, I, and we didn't get to include the last thing. Uh, which to me is the thing that crystallizes why this thing has been so powerful. All the stuff that I got to see uh, during the years. In the spring of 2016, uh, the cast was invited back to the White House by the Obamas to perform again in the East Room. It's not just Lynn this time uh, with Alex Lackmore on the piano. It's going to be the full company. And they're going to perform like an hour's worth of material from the show. Uh, Michelle Obama said that it was like full circle for them because it was like the beginning of their administration. And it gave me this new insight. Well, why do people love this show? We know that it's, there's, the, there's the sort of technical stuff. They're great songs. It's a compelling story. We know that Lane is incredibly good at a lot of stuff. And he surrounded himself with collaborators who are also incredibly good at a lot of stuff. But what I, what I saw Crystal has that day is that we all want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. You know? It's like an important part of being a human being is that you're not alone, you're connected to something. You're part of a bigger story. And what I saw at the White House that day, thank God I didn't have to try to write about this in the book because I wouldn't have had any chance at all of getting it right. You have to imagine Chris Jackson, a black man from Cairo, Illinois, is singing One Last Time, which is the song about George Washington's farewell address. It's the actual words. Lynn quoted the actual words of the farewell address. Chris is singing the song in the East Room six feet in front of the iconic portrait of the actual George Washington that was painted by Gilbert Stewart in 1796. Washington himself was like modeled for Stewart to get it. Turns out it was not entirely Washington because he ran out of time, so like a lot of it is like models. But the face at least is real Washington. So there's Chris Jackson, George Washington. George Washington owned slaves. What would he think about watching this happen now in the White House? And then six feet away from Chris, this direction, is Barack Obama, who, when he gave his, uh, I think it was his inaugural address, or maybe it was his acceptance address back in 2008, described himself as a man whose father might not have been served at a lunch counter in Washington a couple of decades earlier. There's a long and bloody story in this country about how we have to try to reconcile our differences, particularly our differences about race. And to hear Chris sing that song in the middle of this sort of tableau of Washington and Chris's Washington and Barack Obama, all at once it made American history feel like that, like it's a flash, like it's an instant. I didn't even have to turn my head to see it. And I think there's some deep part of power of this show beyond the great songs and the incredible collaboration and everything else, is that it's connecting us to this story again in a new way. Leslie Odom Jr., who created the role of Aaron Burr, told me that he had always felt a little detached from the story of the country. But now that he was inside this story, and he was trying to empathize with Aaron Burr and with what they were going through, he felt like he had a stake in it now. David had told me that if he had seen, when he was growing up in Oakland and getting pulled over by the cops for no reason, when he was a teenager, if he had seen a black man playing George Washington or Thomas Jefferson, a lot more things would have seemed possible for him in his life. Than did. Thank you. It's just a story, right? That's all it is. But this is what I think is true. Stories matter. Stories confer dignity. When you tell your story, you have a sense of agency in the world. When you listen to somebody else's story, it's a show of dignity. It's a show of respect. 
The country is horribly divided right now, more divided than I've ever seen in my lifetime. But I think stories are one of the things that will get us through this. What I came to realize when doing this book is that this is actually the story of these two revolutions of Hamilton are actually aspects of the same revolution. And that revolution is about bringing the country together. That's what Hamilton wanted to do. That's what the show Hamilton is doing. Usually when I talk to groups of people about the book, I'm talking to adults. And I always tell them this. To me, the real revolution that happens is what the next generation of people who are experiencing this show when they're young are going to be inspired to create. But today, that's not like they, that's you. Like, you're the generation that is growing up with this show and becoming a phenomenon. I've seen almost every phase of the creation of this show, dating back to before it was a note written. Um, I'm very excited to see the phase of it that will be yours. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 